My name is Victor Furman. Some call me The Voice. I've always been fascinated with human nature, spirituality, science, and the crossroads at which they meet. Join me now and we will explore these topics and so much more with fascinating guests, authors, and experts who will guide us to Destination Unlimited. Is empathy a superpower? If so, how may we embrace empathy as a daily healing practice in our lives and relationships? My guest this week on Destination Unlimited is my dear friend, Dr. Judith Orloff. Dr. Orloff is a psychiatrist, an empath, New York Times bestselling author, and a UCLA clinical faculty member. Her books have included The Empath Survival Guide and Thriving as an Empath. She synthesizes the pearls of conventional medicine with cutting-edge knowledge of intuition, energy, and spirituality. Dr. Orloff specializes in treating highly sensitive people in her private practice. She's been featured on the Today Show, CNN, Oprah Magazine, and the New York Times. Her website is drjudithorloff.com, and she joins me this week to share her new book, The Genius of Empathy. Please join me in welcoming to Destination Unlimited, Dr. Judith Orloff. Welcome, Dr. Orloff. Thank you, Vic. So nice to have you with us, and congratulations on your brand new book, which was the introduction was done by the Dalai Lama, His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. How did that make you feel? It made me feel incredible. Um, but the, the Dalai Lama focuses so profoundly on empathy and compassion. I think it was right up his alley because this is what he truly believes in. And I feel so honored that he chose to write the foreword to the genius of empathy. That's so wonderful. Congratulations. Let's start with what inspired the genius of empathy? Well, what inspired the genius of empathy was that, you know, I look at the world and the world isn't working really, you know, it's, it's just falling into old traps of resentment and polarization and hatred. And, and we need something else. And empathy has always been near and dear to my heart because I'm an empath. Um, but I wanted to devote a book on empathy and how to reach it in a variety of situations and why we would want to do that. Because I present empathy in the genius of empathy as a healing force and a healing energy to tap into, not just as a, a something nice to do. But when we tap into empathy, we literally can change our biochemistry and the energy flowing in our bodies and our environment around us. And we need that in our world today. Let's begin with your early path. When did you first realize that you were able to feel the feelings of others? And how did this manifest for you? As this first began when I was a little girl, and I noticed that I could feel what my mother was feeling, or feel what strangers were feeling, or I would go into a shopping mall or crowded place and feel what everyone there was feeling and walk out exhausted or overwhelmed. And I didn't realize I was an empath at that point. And what an empath is, is somebody who doesn't have the normal filters that other people have. So I take on the various emotions and energies of the world, like an emotional sponge. And so I did not have any tools back then to learn how to deal with that. And so it's taken me many years uh, to develop you know, many of the skills I talk about in the book that can teach people how to be empathic and also learn how to set healthy boundaries so you're not taking on all this energy that isn't serving you. Can you remember or share with us some of the experiences early on when you started sensing and feeling things and what it was like? It was my nature. It was something I did naturally. And it was overwhelming because nobody else did it around me. Um, and my parents, who were both physicians, said never mention these insights or intuitions or, you know, whatever you're picking up again around my friends or other people. 
And so I grew up ashamed of my abilities and I, you know, got very heavily involved with drugs in my teenage years to try and squash my abilities. And then I, I had a near death experience where I went over a, a cliff in a car and after which I survived miraculously. And uh, afterwards, my parents forced me to see a psychiatrist who turned out to be an angel in my life, who taught me that to be whole, I had to embrace my deepest empathy and my intuitions and my spirituality into my being. I couldn't keep running from them because it wouldn't work. You chose a career in medicine with psychiatry as your specialty. What role has being an empath played in your work? Central. <laughs> Central. It's, it's the heart of my practice, being an empath. I combine both traditional medicine, um, everything I learned at UCLA, Wadsworth VA Hospital, um, the University of Southern California, the county hospital. Um, I combine all that knowledge with empathy, intuition, and um, energy medicine. And so whenever I see patients or whenever I give workshops, I'm always listening with all those different ears. And it's a very natural thing to do for me. I've been doing it for you know over 25 years. So I've had lots of practice and I've had lots of amazing experiences and success experiences integrating. And so in my books, I like to present that integration as a possibility for the readers, you know, and how do you incorporate empathy into your family? You know, how do you incorporate empathy into your work? You know, where is it appropriate? What does empathy mean? What doesn't it mean? You know, it, what it doesn't mean is that you're on call 24 hours a day for everyone in need. That is not healthy empathy. There's a chapter on what healthy empathy is and how to achieve it rather than being a martyr. Um, and so it's important to learn how to set boundaries with your empathy, give when you can, when you're tired, rest and say no, um, and have it a balancing of self-care and giving to others. Just empathic people, you know, this book is for empaths and people who are just simply interested in developing empathy who aren't necessarily empaths but it's for everyone who wants to find a form of healing in their own bodies and in their own lives that comes from the compassion and empathy that we all have and it it can change your life it can enhance your relationships and better the world without a doubt and empathy, like charity, begins at home, taking care of yourself first, right? It does. And there's a chapter on self-empathy. And you think that would be the easiest thing to do, just to be nice to ourselves. But it's really the hardest thing to do. Now, I've had conversations with other therapists over the years, you know, saying, why is it so much easier to take care of our patients than it is ourselves? And it's just a common dilemma. And if you're experiencing this, you know, don't feel shamed or anything, but it's important to be able to shift that and be able to show empathy for the experiences that you go through in life. Life can have its ups and it can have its downs. And you want to be self-empathic the whole ride. You don't want to give up your empathy when things start to get really rough. Because life is a combination of many things. And if you're going through a physical challenge, if you're going through an emotional challenge, your self-empathy will be your best friend. You need it. It's the last thing you need to do is to be beating yourself up as you're trying to heal. Have colleagues ever asked you about your empathic abilities? Oh, all the time, because I've written... <laughs> I've written these books about them, and um, I do trainings for healthcare practitioners on how to incorporate empathy and intuition into patient care. And so I'm very candid about my abilities um, for those who, who want to learn how to also do it and combine those aspects of themselves. You no, know, it's very important. And for, let's say, physicians who don't believe in any of this, and there are many, 
um, I could still be friends with them. It's not <laughs> deal breaker. Um, Absolutely. It's uh, it's a difference, you know. If they're happy not doing this, I'm happy for them. You know, I just know that there's a lot of people who are attracted to developing these aspects of themselves to be more whole. But that doesn't mean everybody. Every it's it's not for you if you don't want it. Basically, you have to be attracted to it to develop it, and then it will be a beautiful right path for you for an entire lifetime. For those who may be unsure, and you've touched upon some of these elements, what is an empath, and what are some of the traits and abilities? Well, an empath is somebody who doesn't have the regular filters that other people have, so we feel everything. We feel what's going on in strangers. We feel what's going on in people who are suffering in other countries. We feel what's going on with family members, um, but so much so it can overtake us and deplete us. So we go on sensory overload. And so empaths also the, the positive traits are intuition, um, connecting to nature, love and service, being in nature and, and helping the earth, um, listening to music, giving to others, helping, being helpers, and um, just loving. Um, they're not really into loud noises um, or big events. Empaths would rather want have one-to-one -one meetings. Uh, or just small meetings that are quiet, uh, rather than, let's say, going to a Madonna concert, as one of my extroverted friends just went to and loved it, you know. And empaths can be introverted, they can be ambiverts, which is in the middle between introvert and extrovert, or they can be extroverted. So I happen to be an introvert and, um, and an empath, but the empaths are different. But even the extroverted empaths need to recoup their energy and decompress after they're around a lot of people. It's very important. Otherwise, they go on overload. You touched upon some of the biological aspects of this. Is there a scientific explanation for being an empath? Um, yes, and there's a psychological and, and a neuroscience explanation for empathy, not just being an empath. But... Um, you can look at empaths as being the highest on the spectrum of the empathy spectrum. Um, and they're able to sense and know and pick up things, I think, more than other people. But midline, midpoint empathy, which is on the mid, midpoint of the, the uh, empathy spectrum, has so many interesting um, neuroscience explanations there's something called the Mother Teresa effect, which just fascinates me, where it's been proven that if you witness an act of empathy, somebody's being empathic on the street, let's say, and researchers were to measure your blood at that point, your immunity would have gone up, your stress hormones would have gone down, and all kinds of good things would be circulating in your blood as a result of simply witnessing the act of empathy. And I want you to really think about that. That is really powerful. The act of empathy is healing, not only for the person experiencing it, but the observer. Who? I mean, that is really powerful. You know, I, I was in the gym the other day, and a woman was there with her husband who lost the use of his legs. And she and he was on one of the machines working out his arms, and she just lovingly put her arms around him and gently, it looked like they were making love, actually, mm. you know, they gently lifted him up and put him in his chair in the slowest, most loving way. And I felt so much love coming from that. And it just rushed through my system, you know, as well as a, a faraway observer. And so it's, I just want people to know that the genius of empathy is about developing something really powerful in yourself. And it's the power of, of love. It's the power of the heart. 
And you can feel it. It's energetically uplifting and healing in the body to witness such things. Therefore, it's important that we create acts like that in the world so others can witness it, so we can experience the healing of it. And the recipient, by all means, will feel the the healing of it. And so the neuroscience of empathy and being an empath, um, it involves the mirror neuron systems in the brain, the compassion neurons. And it's thought that with empaths, the compassion neurons are on overdrive, where they're going much faster than um, with ordinary empathy, which is ordinary, I mean, exceptionally orient, uh, exceptionally ordinary and wonderful and amazing. Um, but it's uh, having the compassion neurons on overdrive. And so you feel more compassion for everybody all the time. And it sometimes can deplete you. So the trick of empathy and empath is learning how to find balance in your life. It's learning how to give and to appreciate the empathy that's shown to you and to others in the world. And just instead of just going on to the next thing, let yourself feel it as there's healing energy that comes from it. And uh, Vic, I know with you, I've experienced it so many times, you know, as you're so empathic, you know, just being around you and the, the love in your heart can make my energy rise and be more heart centered and we can do for each other we can do this for our friends and our family and for strangers even just by emanating empathy in, in a in a line let's say in a market obviously for those who haven't learned to train this gift there are both blessings and curses aren't there um, yes. Well, I think that, you know, the biggest curse is that, or so-called curse, is that you just get so exhausted all the time from from being empathic. And um, it's very painful to go on empathy overload. It's extremely painful. And so you want to avoid it at all costs. So when people are developing their empathy, um, they need to learn how to set limits with it and how to regroup. And to come back and have some alone time and meditation time and really come back to yourself rather than interacting with people. Because otherwise you'll get burnout and that could be a long process of illness and um, depression or anxiety or panic or fibromyalgia. The body can turn against you if you're overloaded all the time. You don't want to do that to the body. And so... That's the, the, I don't know, the challenge, I think, is a better word than curse. Some people are labeled as highly sensitive people. Is there a difference between being an empath and being a highly sensitive person? A highly sensitive person is a little bit down, lower on the spectrum in the sense that they don't usually have the issue of being an emotional sponge and absorbing other people's energy. But they are very sensitive to sensory inputs, such as light, smells, sounds, um, crowds, you know, any kind of sensory input that's intense, they could get over, uh, overloaded from. So that's just uh, one step down on the spectrum of, of empathy. And then below that are people with everyday empathy, which is gorgeous. And in the book, I talk about the various types of everyday empathy. You could have cognitive empathy. For instance, some people have empathy with their minds, and that's all they want to go, where they want to go. They don't want anything else. They're comfortable with that, and that's fine. You know, if they don't want to go further than that, that's fine. Any kind of empathy I honor. And then there's emotional empathy where you can actually feel the emotions of somebody else. Um, but in the book, I also teach you how not to take those on. There's intuitive empathy, where you might relate to people intuitively and get flashes uh, about them, images, impressions, sights, smells, sounds, knowings. Um, you might relate to people that way and 
just as a warning, uh, it's important to avoid intuition overwhelm where you're getting too much information too fast. Um, and so that could overwhelm you as well. And then there's spiritual empathy where some people's default form of empathy is that they relate to people spiritually where they see the goodness in others and they see what the person can do to help themselves in the world and they can see the white light above their heads. Um, and it's just a particular orientation. It's it's more of a natural stance for, um, you know, let's say some ministers or monks or nuns, you know, to, you know, come from that place of, of seeing with a capital S um, from the spiritual standpoint of a person's energy. And so no matter what your default is for your empathy type, you can learn to develop it or you can learn to test the other types of empathy types and uh, you know, really begin to develop many different variations on empathy in terms of how you sense the world. My guest is Dr. Judith Orloff, her brand new amazing book, The Genius of Empathy. Dr. Orloff, please share with our listeners where they can get your books and find out more about you and your amazing work. Uh, yes, you can buy The Genius of Empathy um, at www.drjudithorloff.com. Um, and it has a special offer with a free ebook, free empathy ebook, and empathy gift collection with the purchase of the book, www.drjudithorloff.com. And you can find out about my book tour schedule there and come and, and visit me on an event and we can have a, an empathy talk and we can talk about all kinds of aspects of empathy and spread it around in the world. Absolutely. My guest is Dr. Judith Orloff. We'll be back with more after these words on the OM Times Radio Network. The best of the holistic, spiritual, and conscious world. OM Times Radio. IOM FM. Om Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment, a philanthropic organization. Their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Om Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Imagine yourself being transported to India, to the banks of the Ganga, and an ashram in Rishikesh. Visualize that you are welcome to satsang with an American sannyasi who shares the wisdom of her guru. Your visualization has manifested. Join Satvi Bhagawati Saraswati for inspiration and transformation every Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern on OM Times Radio. Adopt US Kids presents What to Expect When You're Expecting A Teenager Learning the Lingo GOAT G O A T Acronym stands for Greatest of All Time As in Spaghetti Sandwiches for Dinner They're my fave Dad You're the GOAT You don't have to speak teen to be a perfect parent Thousands of teens in foster care will love you just the same Visit adoptuskids.org Brought to you by the US Department of Health and Human Services Adopt US Kids and the Ad Council so I'm a cat, and I just moved in with this new human, and she's got this little toy she's always playing with, all day long. Tap, 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 bloop, bloop. She can't put it down. There it is. Oh, and get this. She even talks to it. Last week, she asked it for Chinese, and guess what? Egg rolls showed up, like magic. Humans have cool toys. A person is the best thing to happen to a shelter pet. Be that person. Adopt. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the shelterpetproject.org. Back on Destination Unlimited, my guest this week is Dr. Judith Orloff. Her new book is entitled The Genius of Empathy. Dr. Orloff, many people have been told you're too emotional or you're too sensitive and they grow up feeling like there's something wrong with them. Is it your experience that many of these people are actually empaths? Oh, yes, that's very typical of being an empath where people are told that they're just too emotional and um, there's something wrong with them, that there's something that needs to toughen up or change. And it can be a very shaming message. That was the message I got as a child 
Um, and I want to tell everyone who's been ever told you're overly sensitive, it's not true. You're not overly sensitive. You're beautifully sensitive, exquisitely sensitive. But you may need to learn how to set boundaries and limits, and you may need to um, be, have a better radar for positive people rather than getting involved with narcissists, sociopaths, or psychopaths. Um, that's all true, but um, your sensitivity is a gift. I remember as a child being told that I was overly sensitive and also that I had an overactive imagination when I would share things that no one else could pick up on, uh, but I've come to absorb them as an adult and to learn how to move forward with them and use them properly, so absolutely. There's an old cliche that women are more sensitive than men. Does gender play a role when it comes to being an empath? Um, I think gender does play a role in that um, both men and women are, are empathic and intuitive. I just want to say that. But culturally, particularly in the West, men are given a really hard time about being sensitive and being a crybaby and being a whiner and being a mama's boy. Um, and not wanting to go to football games, but rather wanting to go for a walk in the woods to write poetry. So men have had a horrible time with it growing up in Western culture. And not that women have had it perfectly, but women women are, quote, emotional. You know, they're considered emotional. And men, you know, who are emotional are not really considered uh, strong. So hopefully all, all that is changing. I'm doing my best to help help those stereotypes that are untrue change. Um, but, you know, they're, they're still in existence. And I have a, a Facebook group with about 22,000 empaths. And most of the sharing happens with women. And occasionally a woman, a woman would say, where are all the men? And uh, then suddenly a bunch of them would appear and say, we're here, we're listening. Um, I just have never felt comfortable sharing about my sensitivities because I've been made fun of or called a crybaby. And they stick around for a while and then they kind of recede again. And it's mainly the women sharing. What are some of the challenges that empaths may face in their personal relationships? Ah, personal relationships. Well, you know, in relationships, and there's a chapter on relationships in uh, The Genius of Empathy, men can face challenges such as not listening in a particular way to a woman. When a woman shares her emotions, um, sometimes men can be considered overly rational or wanting to come in and solve the situation too quickly. You know, rather than being empathic with what the partner is going through, you know, saying, I, I see you're going through a lot, just something minimal even. But um, a, a mistake that many men make is coming into, or ma many linear, linear people make, they come in and want to solve the problem too quickly. And that doesn't feel good coming from let's say I'm the person who is sharing something, I need to be listened to. You know, I don't need to be told what to do in the first five seconds of of uh, my sharing. It feels uh, very abrupt to do that, and um, and so it's important when you're in a relationship that's empathic. You want to listen to each other. You want to listen to what each other says. You don't want to talk over each other. You don't want to overwhelm each other with too many questions or too many uh, subjects brought up at once. Is that's a, a mistake that many people make? Is that they begin they express one thing. Let's say you know I I don't feel comfortable with the way that you brought up having your parents come and visit. Um, and then the other person will say, Oh, well, what do you mean? And then they'll go on from the parents visiting to 10 other things that they have gripes about. And by the time they're finished expressing everything, the other person is so overwhelmed, they can't remember anything. And so it's important when you're empathically communicating um, is to bring up one subject at a time 
And you can talk about other subjects later, but if you keep it very focused like that, you're more likely to reach a solution and a loving solution. Now, in the book, I talk about the art, the high art of empathic listening. Um, as I don't think um, many couples are taught that. They get into blaming and shaming and talking over the other one, which never, never works. But empathic listening is letting someone have a chance to talk and really just listening and not saying too much. You can say, uh-huh, or, you know, I know what you mean. But it's not about interjecting your opinions or anything. It's about just listening to where a person is at, given a, a specific time limit. Now, I don't really prefer open-ended sharings because they could go on forever and they're exhausting for me. And so when I am empathically listening to somebody, I will set a limit. Like, let's, yes, I'd like to listen, but for about five minutes or 10 minutes. And then we can take it from there and decide what to do. But I don't, I like to have limits to my listening time if that's possible. Sometimes the situation is such that it needs to go on longer. But with, with most people, you can listen a lot and give high quality listening um, in five or t- 10 minutes. Um, and so that's important that you establish empathic listening, you know, with, with others by setting a time limit, by having privacy, and by truly listening with your heart and not your head and not checking your phone and not getting looking distracted and, and not being too intense either. You don't want your eyes to probe somebody when they're sharing. That's, that's it. That can be misconstrued or construed as, as a intrusive. So you want to just be careful in terms of staying in your heart, sending out heart energy when you listen, not saying too much. Because most people, they want to be heard. They want to be seen. They want to be valued. And that is the most important thing. You could be across from somebody who you think, I don't like them. I don't have the same values as these people. They're so hostile. They're this and they're that. And if you sit there and do an experiment and sit there across from them and they could say the most outrageous thing and you could you could say something like, I, I heard you, I hear what you say. I'll, I'll give it some thought. And just that will remove so much resistance on the other person's side. Instead of you arguing with them or telling them what a horrible person they have to have those beliefs, you've opened a door up for future communication in a lot of cases. You know, it's interesting because a couple of years ago, this concept brought through a poem from me called The Gift of True Listening. May I share it with you? Sure. There often are words that need to be heard without cutting in or positioning. Your heart will be stirred and compassion conferred as you offer the gift of true listening. You'll create sacred space while bestowing great grace with love all around you glistening. It may be any place where a soul you embrace as you offer the gift of true listening. So gift someone near you by saying, I hear you, lifting them up with your christening. And one day when you're due, you'll be heard too, receiving the gift of true listening. Oh, what a beautiful voice you have, Vic. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think that message is so important because in today's world, people are screaming and not really listening to one another. So thank you for sharing all that you shared about that. Dr. Orloff, what is emotional contagion and how does it impact the empathic person? Emotional contagion is when emotions get spread from one person to another, usually in a workplace or a gathering of people. For instance, if somebody comes into work and says, oh, my God, I'm going to lose my job. (laughs) And that panic will spread over the whole uh, workplace. You know, everyone will think, oh, am I going to lose my job? It's just like uh, panic energy that's spread as opposed to. I'm so happy to see everyone today. 
you know, and then you have positive emotional contagion where you go, oh, that's nice. And everybody feels a little bit more uplifted. And so emotions have energy. Um, empaths feel the emotional implications the most. Um, somebody who's an emotional, has emotional empathy as their primary style, um, might feel it very strongly. Um, but we feel emotions and they can uh, take speed in an environment with a lot of people. In a hospital, you want to have the communications be calm, calm as possible, and loving, as opposed to panicked or mean or abrupt. Um, and so that will create more healing in the hospital. Um, most people aren't taught this, unfortunately. I mean, some of the nursing staff is if they they go to energy healing workshops and they they learn how to hold their energy. I mean, I I think that's a primary skill for healthcare providers is to learn how to move your energy, learn how to come from your heart, learn how not to let negative emotional contagions spread over the whole hospital unit. Um, and so it's important to know that emotions are contagious, positive ones. You can spread gratitude. You can spread empathy. You can spread understanding, you know, or you can spread panic and fear and uh, doubt, and um, which, which is often a, a technique for fear mongering. What technique would you offer to those who experience someone starting to spread panic? How can they turn that around? Um, well, I would leave the room for one thing. If I had a question, I mean, I wouldn't want to be around it. I would, you know, say I have to go to the bathroom. That's always a good excuse. Um, but you want to get out of there. You don't want to see what empaths do and what highly empathic people do or people who are caring. They want to sit it out. You know, they want to be polite. They don't want to rock the boat when they see this, uh, the negative emotional contagion starting up and taking over everything. They they don't want to leave, basically, because they can they perceive that as being impolite. And I am a big believer in setting limits and leaving and not enduring negative emotional contagion if if you can help it. Now, if you have a choice, now if somebody starts up with me in my life about something. Um, you know, if they get uh, a kind of punitive or, or nasty, I'll just say, um, you know, I've really got to go and leave. I won't get into it with them. I just won't be around it. I just, because it's too much of a price I pay being around it. Um, and also you can, if you're in a workplace, you can counter it with um, telling someone how grateful you are to be their coworker. You know, just counter it with something else so and how may someone empathize without taking on the stress of others yes well one of the principles i talk about in the genius of empathy is to observe not to absorb which means you take a step back from somebody as empaths and highly empathic people often jump in other people's bodies energetically and they want to. They feel everything. It's their natural inclination to merge, um, rather than simply attune from a little bit more of a distance. And I think it's healthier to attune from a bit more of a distance. And you can regulate that by keeping your awareness on observing. You can observe some energy, but yet you don't have to take it on. You could even put a shield up in front of your body. Uh, protective shield so that let's say somebody's rage someone's having a rage attack so that rage doesn't get absorbed into your system um, and you could picture a shield all around you um, or take a few steps back the more physically distant you are from the actual focus of the energy the less you'll absorb it um, and don't overstay. You see, I, again, I've worked with so many empathic people who feel it's their job to just listen to the bitter end of these kinds of interactions. And I, I say no. You know, I say you have to protect yourself. And that's self-care. 
you are under no obligation to sit and be abused by negative energy. You know, unless, of course, it's at work and you have, a let's say, a narcissistic boss and you, you can't leave. There's some circumstances like that. That's true. Many years ago, you shared with us the term energy vampire. What happens when you confront one of those? Yeah, it depends who they are. You don't want to confront your narcissistic boss. It won't get you anywhere except fired, which may be where you want to be. Or, or more tormented than, than usual. Um, but you, you have to know who you're dealing with and be very wise. You know, if someone's in a situation with a narcissistic boss, I strongly suggest looking for another job if possible, because that person isn't going to change. You're going to have to kowtow to them and stroke their ego to get even a little of what you need and want from the job. And it's a, you know, it's tedious. And so I would look for another job. But in terms of friendships, no, in terms of, you know, other kinds of relationships that are more fluid, um, I think it's really important to set your limits. You know, I had a patient whose husband um, would have rage attacks at her in the car. And I, you know, t I told her, you know, just at those points, when you come up to a light, just get out of the car. Just tell them I'm leaving. I, I'm not going to subject myself to this if you can't control yourself. And she actually did. She would get out and then take an Uber. Mm -hmm. And that actually helped to train him because he was having visible consequences of his, of his behavior, which is always good. My guest is Dr. Judith Orloff. Her amazing new book, The Genius of Empathy. We'll be back with more after these words on the OM Times Radio Network. Humanity Healing International is a small nonprofit with a big dream. Since 2007, HHI has been working tirelessly to bring help to communities with little or no hope. Our projects are not broad mandates, nor are they overnight solutions. But they bring the reassurance that no one is alone and that someone cares. To learn more, please visit HumanityHealing.org. Humanity Healing is where your heart is. Hello, I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, host of Om Times Magazine's flagship radio show, What is Going Om? My passion is sifting through information, research and innovations from new thought teachers, speakers and researchers pushing back the boundaries of what we know about life, energy, metaphysics and the universe. I love shifting perceptions about who we are, why we're here and how quickly impossible becomes normal when we open our minds, expand our awareness and accept that the only limits that exist are those we place upon ourselves. So if you're the kind of forward-thinking, eager investigator of what lies beyond the current reality that most perceive, why not make a date to come play with me in the field of possibilities at 4 p.m. Pacific Time, 7 p.m. Eastern Time every Thursday. And together, we can discover what's really going on. If I could be you. And you could be me. For just one hour. If you could find a way. To get inside. Each other's mind. Walk a mile in my shoes. Walk a mile in my shoes. Walk a mile in my shoes. We've all felt left out. And for some, that feeling lasts more than a moment. We can change that. Learn how at belongingbeginswithus.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Walk a mile in my shoes. More than 24 million Americans have an autoimmune disorder, and that number continues to grow. I'm Sharon Saylor, and I'm one of those 24 million. To put that number in perspective, cancer affects about 9 million and heart disease up to 22 million. That's why I've brought together top experts and those thriving regardless of their diagnosis to bring you the latest, most up-to-date information. Join me, Sharon Saylor, Friday night, 7 p.m. Eastern, for the Autoimmune Hour on Life Interrupted Radio to find out how to live your life uninterrupted. Grab a cup of tea or a glass of wine and tune in for Inspired Conversations with publisher Linda Joy on Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern. Linda creates sacred space for leading female luminaries, empowering authors, heart-centered female entrepreneurs, coaches, and healers. A soulful venue where guests openly share the fears and obstacles they've overcome, wisdom and lessons learned, and the personal journey that led them to the transformational work they do in the world. Inspired Conversations to empower you 
on your path to authentic, soulful living. Hi, this is Bill Maher. I can find humor in almost anything, but one thing I never laugh about is cruelty to animals. If you don't get the joke either, write People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, 501 Front Street, Norfolk, Virginia, 23510. Back on Destination Unlimited, my guest this week, Dr. Judith Orloff. We're talking about her new book, The Genius of Empathy. In The Genius of Empathy, you refer to it as a superpower. How so? Empathy is a superpower because it can heal you and it can transform relationships that were weren't working at all before and make them to at least be compatible, let alone loving. Um, and empathy can help to heal you physically, emotionally, in terms of your relationships, and it can help heal the world as well. For instance, if many of my patients feel powerless listening to the news, they get so drained from it, and they want to help the world, but they don't know how. And I'm telling you, if you sit by your sacred space, or if you don't have one, just you know a place to just have a candle and some incense where you can sit quietly and do a meditation and focus on your heart energy and put your hand on your heart and feel that warmth generated there and send your prayers of empathy and love to those who need it in the world. That energy will go exactly where it's needed and it will find that person who's lost or that person who is just about to give up and it will suddenly bring a, a bright light to them and lift them up and it's magic how how this works how the energy knows exactly where to go but don't ever underestimate the power of your empathy and love when it's sent across miles and oceans and millennium it can travel and it could do wonderful powerful things you can sit at your space and do this. Everyone, there is not one person listening who can't do this. If you if you just do it, don't see what happens is the mind will say, oh, what good can I do? I'm just one person and you can do so much good. No, I believe in the power of one. I really do. The power of one. I know what it's like to sit alone on my altar. I do it every night and I know how that love and that empathy can be sh shine on yourself, on others, and on the world. And I, you just try it, and you'll feel it. You'll feel the goodness of it, and you'll feel the power of the energy and the healing aspects of empathy is what I'm most interested in in this book. For those who have never done this before, how can they tap into that energy? The healing aspects of empathy... You just take one stop a minute and close your eyes and put your hand on your heart and envision something that you have such empathy for. It could be, you know, your doggy or your, your cat or your little child or the moon or the stars or the ocean. Focus on what moves you and let that build up in your chest area. And show yourself empathy with that energy. Say, I know how hard you've been trying, and I appreciate you, and you're doing a great job. Tell yourself that, coming, with, coming from that energy. And allow yourself to take the edge off and heal and feel the softness and feel the flow of what empathy can be as opposed to the rigidity of the mind, which is quite different. What are some practical empathy techniques that people can use to heal their relationships? Well, one of the ones we've spoken of, which is empathic listening, is showing your partner that you, or, or your coworker, that you value their opinion and you might not agree with them, but you value them and you want to take the time to listen to them. And when you make other people feel important, that's half the battle and feel listened to, not just dismissed. You know, if you dismiss somebody, it's the most humiliating feeling. Um, and if you get in the habit 
of putting your hand on your heart and showing yourself self-empathy. At the end of the day, keep an empathy journal and say, what areas could I have shown empathy more? And where can I, Where? what areas did I show myself empathy? And um, bravo, you know, really give yourself a lot of positive feedback for the empathy that you do show for yourself and and others because they're you know again life is up life is down you know sometimes it's super intense really intense and so even in those darker times you want to be able to be sweet to yourself especially in those darker times and hold your own hand you know or hold god's hand however you perceive it and just know that you're not alone through anything you go through And when working with others, in addition to the gift of true listening, simple acts of kindness also. Simple acts of kindness, um, smiling, acknowledging somebody saying you look beautiful today, you know, can do so much. Um, Or what a nice thing you just did. You know, I really appreciate you. Just a little something we can do for each other all the time. You know, a little building each other up. <clears throat> That's very important. And a little love goes a long ways. We have all of this negative news and we have all of this social media stuff being thrown around. How may the empath protect themselves from all of that material? Well, the only way I found is that I recommend to my patients is to limit the amount of time you spend on the news because empaths can become uh, addicted to the news. Um, And you don't want to do that because it's so terrible. And there's so many challenging things happening in the world. You know, we're kind of at a low, lower point in a lot of respects. And it's, you know, it's, it's a very challenging time. And so give it, give, give yourself small doses of it. And spend the rest of the time living your life in the present. Go out for a walk. You know, spend, have tea with a friend. Do something. Live life. Don't spend time glued to the news that's not, you're not going to be able to do much about other than sending that love from your heart to the, to the world. You must take a step back and live your life in the present, be loving to your partner, be loving to your children, take that alone time, you know, go walk in the park, go write a poem, you know, go change a life, you know, just stay in the present and and, um, minimize the amount of news. You might want to get minimal exposure to the news, but I wouldn't keep talking about it. I wouldn't keep dwelling on the particularly darker aspects that are going on in certain people because it'll suck you in and you don't want to be sucked in by it. You want to be, we talked about positive emotional contagion before. You want to be where the love is. You want to be where the empathy is. You want to be developing empathy in yourself and not reading so much about all the horrendous behavior of those in the news. No, you want to see that as a reality. I mean, one thing humankind can be brutal and it could be a marvel so empathy lets you feel all of it you know there's a brutality to human nature and and it's also marvelous and miraculous so empathy lets you see both and um you can uh, go towards the marvelous and miraculous aspects a little bit more than you would if you focused on the news all the time What would you like your readers to take away from the genius of empathy? I would like the readers to take away hope, that hope for a better self, better health, better emotions, a better future, better relationships, uh, time out, and also connection, deeper connection to quell the loneliness that may happen in, in our society and around the world to feel a connection to yourself, to spirit, to others, um, and feel the unity of uh, those who value empathy and love and try and come together with that kind of a community and have empathy be your mantra that your entire lifetime. You know, it, it will be mine. 
you know, to the to the very end. I know these values. I believe in them. I know they work, and I know they can uplift you no matter what's happening. So I hope you go away with that knowing as well. The Wisdom of Dr. Judith Orloff, her brand new book, The Genius of Empathy. Dr. Orloff, one more time, please share with our listeners where they can get the book and find out more about you. Yes, you can go to my website, drjudithorloff.com, where you can get the book and a special offer of a free ebook and free um, empathy webinars along with the purchase of the book. Um, that link is there. And also my book tour schedule is there. I'm giving in-person events as well as many online empathy events. And I invite everyone to attend an event and continue this empathy conversation. I want to hear what you're thinking and what you're feeling about this and how we could move this forward as a community of human beings. Dr. Orloff, thank you so much for joining us and sharing the genius of empathy. It's my pleasure, Vic. And thank you for joining us on Destination Unlimited. I'm Victor, the voice Herman. Have a wonderful week. <laughs>